It's great. Uh, Can I get uh, any other Spy Kids fans in the Communal sure Creative Studios? Silence. Silence. Uh, I walked. I we got, got a thumbs up. We uh, got one thumbs up. I got in the house Flute like a couple boobies. of days ago, and my wife was watching Flight of the Navigator. What is that? Is that a Leo movie? No, it's, uh, I don't even know. Oh, no, uh, I'm thinking of the It's Aviator. old, old, even further back. I don't uh, know what that movie did, is. Do you guys know the Flight of the Navigator? That's way before anybody's here's time. Some, like, uh, 1930s? Pretty close. Yeah. Okay. Maybe okay. 40s. Anyways, I'm like, what the hell are you doing watching? Um, have you, uh, your uh, Xbox? No. Your PS? Yeah. Okay. And not so much anymore, but go I'm, ahead. I'm dealing with a very devastated child right now. Oh, did you get locked out? Ever, he's lost everything. What do you mean? I don't. So he. So I didn't have to. I was in a rush to get over here. Yeah. He's laying on his bed, kind of in tears, just about. Because his PlayStation is like fried. So, like I said, what happened? He's like, just all my information gone. I'm like, well, what did you do? And he's like, I didn't. EA did it. And I'm like, well. And so, anyways, he said he was on EA support, and I didn't get enough time to get all the story out of him. But somehow EA did something, and all he's lost every bit of gaming. He's been cheating. He's, he's been hacking. You think, is that what it is, baby? Ah, huh. All right. I don't know. Okay. So you've been running some mysterious software okay. in the background? So I have some extra questions to ask when I get home. Is Did you pay saying. for any nefarious programs <laughs> yeah. to enhance your NHL abilities? <laughs> Interesting. Yeah. Um, so we have a guest tonight who I assumed you were familiar with and that you've seen them perform live. Before. Yeah, like I am very familiar with. Yes. Um, but I don't know for whatever reason. The last time they were in Red Deer was during Canadian Finals Rodeo Week. Um, and that was a busy week at Bose, but I can't I can't think of why I didn't go. I just know that that show was talked about. It was, and Ryan Ryan actually a long time after. Yeah, Ryan mentioned it and said that there were people there very moved emotionally. And I think it was a big yeah. deal because that was, if I'm not mistaken, that would have been their twenty fifth anniversary. Correct. Tour, yep. which was also a reunion. Like they they'd they been, been inactive for a long, long time. For so. quite some time. We are going to talk to Brad Roberts of the Crash Test Dummies. One of the most unique voices. You know, it's funny. We go to last Base week's episode baritone. and talking to Dan's with the OBG. I'm yeah. saying there's not another album that sounds like the ends. Yeah. They're like, name another band that sounds like the Crash Test Dummies. Name another voice. Hard pressed. You're hard pressed to do it. Hard pressed. Um, so, yeah, we're, we're, we're hanging out here. It's been a hot fucking day. In Red Deer, like really hot, like <laughs> humid humidity. I don't think I've experienced in Central Alberta before. I did go home to change because it was. I treated it as a very casual, casual Friday at work uh, today. Well, yeah, I saw you're wearing like <laughs> swim trunks. <laughs> what the hell? Were they board swim shorts? Trunks. They were like. Do you do legit, board shorts? They were legit swim trunks. I would do board shorts, but they were. They're What's legit. your preferred bathing suit? That one. With so you you prefer wearing underwear when you go swimming? Who said I was wearing underwear? I don't understand these board shorts. Can anyone explain board shorts to me? What's the point of wearing underwear when you're fucking swimming? Yeah, that's good. Because that's what they're for, right? You can't just wear those with nothing on. There's no, like, lining or anything. No, no, they are just... I'll, Recording you know in next, progress. Next, uh, next, next show in, I will, uh, I'll bring my board shorts. We'll ask Brad Roberts pretty, what his thoughts are on board shorts. Some pretty colorful board shorts. Thank God the camera doesn't reach under the table, because if Pete was wearing his board shorts without any... What's the what? What word did they use for underwear back in the day? Back in the seventies. <laughs> I'm old, but I'm not gaunt like gaunch. <laughs> yeah, there we go. That's the, the exact word. That's I was not trying a seventies word, is what it? What is that? Is a word for underwear? I think that was a Saskatchewan word. Gaunch oh. or gitch. See, gaunch that one gitch. sounds way worse. Gaunch or gitch. Gitch. We should do an worse. urban dictionary search up on both of those words <laughs> and make sure we didn't just severely fuck up. Um, so thank you for going home and changing. I appreciate that as someone sitting beside you. But the board shorts are coming next show. I went home, showered, and changed before coming to Communal oh, Creative Studios. Yeah, the showering is... Need to. Almost a, like a two-a-day shower, three-a-day shower in this kind of humidity. Right now? Is it just sticky, muggy? Yeah. It's like hot. the only day of the year where I'm like, ah, maybe I should cut some of my hair off. And then I'm like, nah. Wow. That why, is a, why waste the money? It's a very fleeting thought, I hope. Fleeting. Fleeting, fleeting indeed. So you're going camping next week? Yes. And you're going to bring your acoustic guitar and do some campfire sing-alongs? Uh, uh, harmonica. <laughs> harmonica. So yeah, producer Riley guitar. went and saw Alanis last night. Was that last night? Yes. Oh, yeah, it was last and night. And you went and saw Alanis the, the night before. And she plays a pretty mean harmonica. That was the one thing I saw in the Calgary subreddit was people were raving about the show, but there was also a bunch of people making fun of the harmonica. 
Why? How so? Uh, one of the jokes I saw was all these years, and she still hasn't learned how to play it. <laughs> Which I don't know. I, I've never seen her play harmonica. So, but Riley said that Atlantis opens up the show with the harmonica. Sure, sure you don't need to learn. I, now, I'm not a musician, so maybe you guys, Ryan, you can. Can Ryan play the harmonica? Uh, you put a harmonica into my hand, and I can fake something that's going to sound pretty fucking good. Don't make me. I'll do it. I mean, I'm willing to let you try just so we can see if you're you're right or not. Board shorts and harmonica next show. That'll be episode six. And you had a tank top on today, which I've never seen in my life. Sunzo Gunzo, baby. That's so funny. So funny. Um, why were why were you doing that? It's wacky, wacky clothing oh, day at work. Dress up that way? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Well, we got another Ted, you know, mm-hmm. from the ODR mm-hmm. podcast. Uh, works at the station and he has this thing called Fun Shirt Friday. Yeah. And he's got some pretty cool shirts, but I'm like, well, why stop at a shirt? That's true. Go all the way, all the way. O O D, baby. <sighs> what do you think? What do you think is going to happen here? Because I was wondering, because 7, seven o'clock one. our time is fairly late. It's 9 uh, New York time. Assuming he's in, he still lives in New York? Pretty sure it's okay. still New York. It's a kind of a, and I, I'm hoping. But I mean, New York is just waking up at 9 p.m. Yeah, that's a good point. That's a good point. I guess it depends where in New York he is. Is he in the city? Is he upstate? Maybe we're going to get to find out, and maybe we're not. This is, I think I've mentioned it on the he's show in before. He's Oh, really? I have no idea. Oh, okay. Um, I mentioned on the show before, but there was a great MT or much music show called The Wedge. Mm-hmm. And it came back a number of years ago, hosted by Damien Abraham from Fucked Up. I, I only think it lasts a couple seasons, but there's one episode where the entire episode is dedicated to him trying to finally get his interview with uh, Riff Raff, a.k.a. Jody Highroller. And... Um, he had been turned down or stood up by this rapper for, I, th- I seem to remember, two, three, maybe four interviews. And this time, he had the interview, and I think it was in Florida. And they went down to Florida, and that's the episode. It's just him waiting around, being stood up Actually again by this went fucking went to Florida? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Well, why couldn't we have gone to New York and chase Brad Roberts down hey, there? If we were living in Toronto, we very easily could. <laughs> Probably could have. We very easily could. And we have I someone do in the waiting room. see a waiting room name with Brad Roberts. So I think this might be it. The road to the stage. To find out. Greenwich? Admit. Greenwich? What are you? No, I'm not betting. I don't, not know betting? The, I don't know the New York City geography well lower, enough. Lower Manhattan? Yes, that's the one. Hello, hello. There he is. How are you guys? Sorry I'm late. No, it's all good. good. Barely, barely. That's uh for, for musicians, that's uh you're almost early. <laughs> we were just saying, so are you're in New York right now? I am. So nine I'm o'clock in... New York, it's like the city's just waking up right now, right? Well, as we, we you were speaking, a siren was just blasting <laughs> away. I'm surprised you can't hear it over the microphone actually. We 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 heard <laughs> it briefly, but I just thought I thought you maybe put that in yourself just to establish the scene a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> um, so where do you I'm mind if we ask whereabouts? Advanced. What's that? Sorry, if I said if only if I were that technologically advanced. <laughs> <laughs> um, this, I, this looks like a sweet setup you've got. This uh, is this just your living room? Yeah, I didn't even really think about what the scene looked like. It looks amazing. It's like great, very cool. Oh, thanks. Uh, my uh, my wife like literally designed the wallpaper and hung it herself and she's a maniac when it comes to uh uh like that kind of thing and i'm just completely useless (laughs) i wouldn't know what to do with a hammer (laughs) i i i have no technical abilities with like repairing guitars or anything like. oh really even after all these years that's what guitar techs are for right right the Bad language there. <laughs> um, <laughs> so yes, that is what guitar techs are for. <laughs> How long have you? Although been... I don't have one of those, I have to go to whatever guys in town. <laughs> Fair enough. What? Uh, how long have you been living down in New York for? Um, over twenty years now, I think. Wow. Yeah. Wow. That's... I live on Broadway in this uh, rent-controlled apartment. Rent-controlled being the key phrase because rent now in new york the average rent i heard recently here in new york city is five thousand dollars a month holy shit average. wow so and and i'm paying like half that and 
and and my rents can only go up by a certain percent, small percentage point each year. Right. Uh, so I'm. I'm safe from the crazy housing market, but it, it's a totally insane, out of control housing market. The whole world, basically, of rich people have come and moved in to New York and driven up the prices, and no one else can possibly compete with what they're willing to pay. Yeah. And they look at it like an investment, like a safer thing than a bank in their own country. That sounds really xenophobic, like. There are all these outsiders. <laughs> Good clarification. <laughs> um, no, I, I hear you. I mean, I think Toronto is going through similar issues, and well, Vancouver's Vancouver, been suffering sure. from yeah. it for a number of years now as well. Um, yep. Thing is, is that like if none of these regions or these municipalities or these governments, uh, these civic governments, do something about it, like a rent-controlled system in various neighborhoods or buildings in New York, then what is the breaking point? Yeah. Because $5,000 a month, God damn. I mean, that's, I know. that's, Who that's, a, pay that? yeah, no, not, not I, I don't know anyone that could. No, we no. were, I was just in Vancouver and uh, with a buddy who showed me where his brother uh, lives and it's a townhouse. That's probably a good, like 45 minutes from the core of downtown Vancouver yeah. and just a townhouse, three bedroom townhouse, nothing spectacular here in Red Deer would probably go for 275,000. 1.2 million and for yeah. a three bedroom townhouse. Wow. Who can do it? No, I, I don't know. That's crazy. I got into the wrong industry, <laughs> I guess. I guess. <laughs> yeah, well, you know, I'm from Winnipeg and the prices have been driven up even there. And Winnipeg is like a slow, slow to react to all trends in every sphere and even there. It's getting crazy. So but anyway, how, how much do you keep in? Have you still got family in Winnipeg? I do. My dad is. My parents are both still alive. Oh. Unfortunately, my mom has Alzheimer's disease, so she doesn't really know who I am anymore. Although occasionally I'm able to break through, but um, my father is quite uh, sharp, and he's uh, he's in his late 80s now. Wow. Both my parents are really old. But they're still there, and my brother, our bass player, also lives in Winnipeg. For a long time, he lived in London, England, and then in Toronto. Uh, but he ultimately moved back to Winnipeg when he decided to have kids. Hmm. And so I, I go and visit him and his kids and my parents, and I don't do it super often, maybe once a year. Right. Well, it's one thing we talk about on this show, so we've been doing this for about a year and a half. Mm -hmm. And I don't know if you keep up with the music scene in Winnipeg, but, I mean, obviously it's been great in the past with bands like yours, but, like, it's incredible, the music scene in Winnipeg right now, and the variety of it and the, the, the quality of talent that's coming out of Winnipeg is yep. almost second to none. We've done about 60 interviews in the last year and a half, and I would say, what, a solid fifth of those, I, if not more, if have not been more. current manitoba musicians it's pretty wild really yeah yeah it, it is pretty wild. it's crazy it's crazy um it's a very very it seems to be a very cool scene right now at least huh well you know i have to confess i haven't been there in like several years now because of COVID. yep um but we do have a gig coming up there in, uh, with the winnipeg symphony orchestra right. in september so i and I, i'll have to rehearse for that so i'll actually have a an extra evening in town and I'll probably, you know, visit my family. Yeah. So September 15th is the um, show at Bose that, uh, where we are in Red Deer. That's when you guys are, are coming through. Assu yes. Assuming is that, that would probably be after your hometown show, right? Um, no, before. Oh, before. Okay. Okay. Yeah. The hometown show is tacked on to the end of the run. Well, it's even more exciting. Yes. Um, yeah, playing your hometown is always a little challenging, you know, because you know people. <laughs> is it hard to stay focused, right? You've got everybody probably wants a little piece of your time while you're back in town. Uh, yeah, it, that is a little rough. Uh, but not, I mean, not like it used to be. When I was a young, like back in the 90s when I was a young man, I couldn't go anywhere in Winnipeg without being being you know stopped yeah um, now it's not nearly 
that, that like that. And you guys have played with the symphony orchestra in Winnipeg before? We have. Yeah. As a matter of fact, we played with them a few years ago, and it kind of, well, it did. I won't say kind of. Uh, it did, in fact, spur us to go on the road again after not having played together for a long time. Mm -hmm. And um, we got a winning combination with our band and our, our crew. And uh, we travel really light and uh, lean and uh, save money wherever we can and stay in cheap hotels. And we managed to make a living touring. Yeah. I mean, I can hardly believe it. How many years later? Long time. We're still coming out to our shows. We just got back from Europe. We played all over the place in Europe. And people showed up in droves. Uh, same with England. And uh, we have an American tour coming up, too, in August, uh, before any of the Canadian dates that include Red Deer, um, on the West Coast. So we'll be in L.A. and San Francisco and all those groovy places in California. And it should be fun. Good time of year to go there. Yeah. And then we'll, you know, we'll travel up through Portland and Seattle and get to eventually to uh, Vancouver and some surrounding areas like Sydney and Nanaimo. And, yeah. Beautiful yeah, way good. to spend your summer. It really, it really is. I'm really looking forward to it. Um, we were talking about it uh, just a few minutes before you hopped on, but um, the last time you were in Red Deer, which would have been the first time in a long time, I imagine, yep. um, was for their string of shows at Bose for, what was it again? Canadian Finals Rodeo. Rodeo Week. And, um, oh, yes, that's right. Neither of us were at that show, but we heard lots about it afterwards. No um, blowing smoke. Yeah. That People talked about that show, yeah. still talk about that show four years later. Really? Yeah, yeah. Well, it was a really fun show to play. I still remember it. Yeah, apparently, I think a lot of people were able to recapture um, moments and listening habits from from many years prior, right? It was yes, a special moment for them. Yeah, you know, it, a couple of those records that we made in the early days um, are really I've I have found by talking to fans, and when we sign merch, we'll talk, we talk to fans. Um, <clears throat> I found those songs are like a marker in people's lives for events. And they all have always have a story for me about the circumstance in which this song manifested in their lives. And some of the stories are unbelievable. This one guy told me, he didn't tell me, he told my guitar player about how he was in a mine working in a freaking mine shaft and it caved in and it and both his legs were crushed and he was laying in there in a sealed cave full of rocks and he could see a pinpoint of light coming through so he knew that he had air for a little while but maybe not forever and he was laying there wondering if he was going to live or die for like 18 hours before they dug him out. And he said the only thing that kept him sane was singing Superman song over and over and over and over again. And I just thought that that just blew my fucking mind. Pardon my language. Of course. I couldn't believe it. That's, uh, yeah, I don't think that's a very common story for musicians to no. hear about their music. <laughs> No, no, it's so <laughs> intense, man. Wow, that's incredible. I mean, uh, yeah, how do you, uh, yeah, how do you react I, to that? I wish I'd got to meet him. Yeah, well, maybe you will one day. I heard the story secondhand. Yeah, yeah, maybe I will. Wow, that's. Uh, do you do you like? Have you heard many other stories uh, similar to that in the past, like in your career or in your conversations with other musicians? You know that song mm -mm -mm, mm -hmm. where I talk about um, a girl who has birthmarks all over her body in one verse? Yeah. Um, 
I rolled into Nashville one time and we played at this bar. It was in the old, it was years and years ago now. And this waitress came up to me and I saw that her body was covered in these tiny birthmarks. Literally birthmarks all over her body <laughs> like yeah. it was right out of the song and she told me that when she was a little girl she thought that the song was about her oh my god because yeah. nobody had this experience and i'd never seen anybody i've i've seen that kind of birthmark it looks kind of like a brown hairy mole mm -hmm. and um she had she was speckled with them just exactly like the image in the song. And I took the image from the song, in fact, not from someone who was covered in birthmarks, but from myself, because I've got one at the base of my spine in what my doctor called back in the 1960s the bathing suit region. <laughs> <laughs> Which mean, it didn't, meant it didn't show unless I had to, you know, shower up at swimming lessons or whatever. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> At which time I was, of course, tortured for it. <laughs> wow. But, uh, but yeah, she. That was that was a pretty uh, wild experience, seeing how closely she identified with the character. And well, close, and that's how closely she embodied it. Well, and and so that one embodied it. But I mean, it's it's unfortunate. We talked about this the other day as well. Is that song could still ring just as true for somebody today because there are so many birthmarks that make people yes. different and. And, and kind of scared to, to, to be out in public. That song oh. just resonates just as much today. Yes, and a lot of people suffer a lot worse than me because, the, you know, they've got stuff on their face. and um, It's funny, we talk about this. I When I was a little boy, I'll, I'll qualify that by saying I was a little boy. I liked Kiss. And um, I recently read all of the biographies that all of the KISS members wrote, believe it or not. Okay. And one of them, the one about Paul Stanley, he goes into depth about how he was born with a deformity of the ear. And I've forgotten what the technical term is for it, but basically it, his ear looked more like a lump of cauliflower. Yeah. And he was deaf in that ear. He's freaking deaf in one ear, Paul Stanley. And uh, anyways, he was always very embarrassed about his ear and he felt he looked like a freak and, and it really influenced him deeply in his life. Like he didn't have friends for a long time, even at the height of his popularity. And um, he was always remained very withdrawn. And, uh, you know, so people really, like you say, people do suffer terribly from disfigurement mm -hmm. Paul Stanley was very happy when he grew his hair long and it covered up his ear fair enough now we're I think because you had written kiss down on the yeah yeah the, our notes right Are, were you a member of the kiss <laughs> army uh I think I was <laughs> I think me and my little brother my little brother uh, he was at that, that point he was my little brother but now he's my brother Anyways, I think the both of us went down to Sam the Record Man at Unicity in Winnipeg and uh, and joined up and got some paraphernalia in the mail of some sort. So, and I know that Dress to Kill album was important to you. So when was the last time you listened to Dress to Kill? Um, you know, every now and then I'll play it like once every few years. I listened to it fairly recently, as a matter of fact. I listened to it while I was on the road for entertainment because it's got nostalgic value for me. Yeah. I listened to that stuff when I was, you know, 11 years old. And I listened to it under the headphones, like, loud. <laughs> and I knew every sound on the record, you know, every hi-hat hit and every, just everything. So going back to that, and, and listening to it, having made records, I actually understand what's going on now in a way that I didn't back then. Right. You know, like I put on the headphones and it's like, oh, that's what they did. <laughs> that must be nice. 
listening to it all those years later and being able to grab something new. Yeah. Um, are yeah. you are you still teaching guitar? Um, no, I haven't taught guitar in a long time. I taught guitar for a while at the School of Rock here in New York. Yeah. And when I was a much younger man, I taught at a place called Kent's Music uh, in Winnipeg. And that kind of helped pay for my university education, believe it or not. But that's how cheap it was to go to school back then. You could actually teach guitar and, <laughs> and pay to... rent. Well, you know, I didn't pay rent. I just <laughs> stayed home with my parents for the entirety of my college career. <laughs> Smart. So, wouldn't pay rent. <laughs> um, so with that, with the, that, Dress to Kill being such an important album to you uh, in your younger years, was that influential in you learning to play guitar? Is that something that you, you focused on heavily? Uh, well, you know, I, when I took it up the guitar, I took guitar lessons, and I learned the really nerdy way. I okay. learned to read music. Yeah. And um, the m music I was playing was this really, um, you know, pretty awful. But it taught me all the chords, and it taught me all the notes and their names and where they were. I had taken piano lessons, so I kind of knew where C was and yeah. how it was related to, to everything else, what sharps and flats were, the black keys, you know, all that stuff. And I was able to relate that to the guitar. And um, I forget what your question was, actually. With Dress to Kill, was that a, an album that you, you you said it's not the kind of music that you were learning to play guitar on? You're, you, it sounds like you had yeah. much more, um, uh, yeah. That's right. So anyways, I was learning this much more nerdy music. But eventually, somebody taught me a song from Dress to Kill. Or no, it was actually Got to Choose, this kid from down the street from me. And we started hanging out and uh, jamming. With our acoustic guitars, and we would we we played Kiss even on acoustic guitars, just simple bar chords, very very easy songs to play. I mean, Ace Ace Freelay's guitar solos were certainly not easy to play. I can't play them now even. They're yeah, like the guys, for for a super tacky band, <laughs> and for. <laughs> Kind of a fucking idiot, as he is. <laughs> he he really is a hell of a guitar player in his own way. He has he has some bad moments, like the guitar solo low in Love Gun. He just plays the pentatonic scale, which I know sounds like nothing if you don't know anything about music theory. But he just goes up the scale. Da 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 da. da. It's just revolutionary. Right. Yeah, juvenile. <laughs> You know, like, what are you doing, Ace? Uh, but then other stuff that he plays, like, uh, oh, the guitar solos on Dress to Kill are unbelievable. It's funny because Dress to Kill, for all, for anybody who cares about Kiss, Dress to Kill is regarded as one of the first three records which were weak in the production. And um, it wasn't until Kiss Alive, when they made their live record, which actually was, you know, live drums in a crowd and more than one show. And, oh, okay. And then, and then overdubbed later. <laughs> <laughs> but it wasn't until then that they had a hit record. So those first three records, Dress to Hill and Kill included, are generally frowned upon as being... Uh, you know, low production affairs. And hmm. I I actually think that Dress to Kill is the best sounding one of the three of them. The first one, the first two gen, gen, certainly do sound absolutely terrible. Yeah. Just the worst. Just mixed so badly and recorded so wrong. Just everything about it was wrong. It was like a bubblegum pop producer making... Don't quote me on that because I forget. Well, I'm trying to think who, who the Bob, producer was. I, Bob Ezrin jumped in there, but I can't remember when Bob Ezrin started producing. That wasn't Kiss until albums. Destroyer. Okay. Oh, okay. Which was, and that's when they brought in the big guns because they had had a hit with Kiss Alive, and they wanted to follow it up with something more substantial than the basic rock and roll that they'd been doing. 
something more produced. Did you did you get to see Kiss back back in those days? I did when I was in grade seven. Wow. My, my dad took me, God bless him, took me and my little brother who was, you know, in grade five or something. Wow. And we went to the Winnipeg Arena and saw them. I couldn't believe how loud they were. It was just spectacularly loud. That's to the wild. Point of it being oppressive. <laughs> <laughs> Did were you in the Kiss Army? I was not a member of the Kiss. I was a came along just later, a little bit later, later than that. But so for me, it was... a little, hold your head a little higher than me then. <laughs> yeah. Well, I can't much better because my my Kiss was a knockoff of Kiss, which was Motley Crue. So Motley Crue was kind of more my area, and they were just pretty much copied everything that <laughs> Kiss had brought to the table. I think my entry to Kiss, which is not very expansive is just destroyer because i was taking piano lessons and my piano teacher was like oh you should learn this this beth song beth is on destroyer yeah. right oh really and uh yeah, from piano. and i knew i knew like a couple kiss songs like the big hits and then i heard that song i was like that's not the same <laughs> band there's no way this is like just a beautiful peaceful song um that just you know companies are pretty killer records so. yeah yeah written oddly enough by their drummer and another guy. Really? You go right with. Yeah. Peter Chris. He used to get off his drum set and go and sit on a stool and sing it to a reco tape recording. A freaking tape recording. I remember seeing the show and being shocked at how lousy the cassette sounded. <laughs> like it was just a cassette. You know, and back then, cassette players didn't necessarily run at the right speed. You know, so you weren't hearing the music at the right pitch. And sometimes, you know, they would wobble. Yep. You know, they weren't always running exactly smoothly. It was nothing like the digital experience at all. Or yeah. even the advantages of vinyl. It just was an awful medium. And there's a great story of how Beth, do you know how Beth came to no fame? Idea. Do you know no the story idea. of how Beth broke as big as it did? Well, uh, tell me because I've I think I read it recently in Peter Chris's biography, but I want to hear well, what you've heard. Well, and it'd be interesting to see if it's the same. There was a documentary on a radio station in Windsor, Ontario, called The Big Eight, and the story uh -huh. was that they tell in the documentary is that the receptionist of the station was a big fan of the song and urged the program director to get it on the air, and try you know had to work a little bit to get it. That got on the air in Windsor, which of course was right across from Detroit, yep. so it was heavily influential. Detroit wow. hears. Beth being played in Windsor, Detroit starts playing it, and then it just popped off from there. So I don't, is that Peter Chris's side of the story too? Um, his side was more general than that. That's like a you know, a little more specific than what I remember. But um, that that's very interesting. It would not surprise me. I, that's often the way things work. Like when our hip, when our song mm -mm -mm came out. Went nowhere in Canada. Nowhere. And the radio didn't want to play it, and much music didn't want to play the video. And then out of the blue, this one radio station in America, in Georgia, of all freaking places, started playing our record. And people started calling in and going, who's that guy with the deep voice? Like, what's <laughs> going on there? And um, people started buying the record in the area and when the local rep noticed that she brought it to the attention of clive davis who was the head of arista records to whom we were signed in america and clive davis is a a notorious and quite uh fabulously wealthy successful music mogul who decided that okay this band can sell We've seen it. The proof is in the pudding. The record's getting played at this radio station. People are buying the record. Let's chase it. So they put us, they plugged us into the machine. And all of a sudden, everything was different. At every show we went to, the record company was there. And they were putting up posters and they were talking to people and they were talking to us. And, um, you know, like, that hadn't happened at all, really, prior to to our getting launched by Clyde Davis. And uh, then after that, it was, you know, just a matter of time and hammering away. So then how, uh, so it was right around that time that song's taken off. I think 
probably just as it's taking off. Uh, lead me through how that song ends up in the greatest movie of all time. In one of the best scenes oh. of the movie, how does how does the placement in Dumb and Dumber come together? Well, Dumb and Dumber was a double header for us because not only did they want to use Mm-mm-mm, which I had written and recorded already, but they wanted us to make a re-record of Peter Pumpkinhead by XTC. And we were covering that song at the time. Oh. Um, because I wanted Ellen to sing a song. And I knew it would be in her range because Peter, Andy Partridge has a really high male voice and she has an alto female voice. So it, it worked in the same key signature. And um, it's a tremendous song. And for whatever reason, the, this Dumb and Dumber, these Dumb and Dumber people came to our show, heard us playing this song and wanted us to make a recording of it. So we did, and it became a big hit. And uh, <clears throat> I was quite amazed. I, I mean, I had no, no idea why they came after us. Um, I mean, we, we, it was very early. I, well, I, I do know because the record had started to break by then. Right. But we got some really early, lucky early breaks, like. We were on Saturday Night Live before we were on David Letterman, for example, which almost never happens. Usually, yeah. there, you know, back then there was a hierarchy. You started on, on the sort of low, local level circuit television <laughs> that they had back then. And uh, eventually on up to the major networks. And uh, anyways enough of that um did you ever get to talk to anyone from xdc or, or partridge specifically about your cover i did wow i went and had lunch with them holy shit hmm. and when i was living in london i went up to swindon where he lives and uh, he made me like soup from a from a bag you know like instant soup yeah <laughs> and served me some bread with it and talked my head off and revealed to, real, revealed to me all kinds of secret tips about how he wrote his songs. And I sat there absolutely mesmerized. But he is a very anxious man. Yeah. And I had had a bad day that day and I'd kind of been having a bad time at that time in my life and I... I uh, I was humiliated by this person who worked at the, the, at the tube, which is what they call the subway in London. Um, I somehow had paid the wrong amount of fare for a ride that I had taken. And, and anyways, I mentioned something to this effect to Andy, and it was like he took on my anxiety. Wow. And I could see that he would, you know, he definitely has issues with that. And you know what? So do I. So, like, I'm not pointing any fingers at him or anything. I was very kind of happy to know that somebody else was as screwed up as I can be. <laughs> he's been he's been pretty open about that stuff, too, publicly as well, yeah, right? He um, has, and that's partly why I feel I can say that. But that's, that sounds like, like, do you remember how long you were there for? Um, yeah, a few hours. Wow. Wow. And, and when he, when it comes to telling you tips and tricks about how he wrote his music, I mean, how relatable is that when you're talking to someone with uh, synesthesia? <laughs> <laughs> like it's well, like a, an unattainable gift. Yeah. I mean, I don't have that. Um, he didn't really talk about that to be honest. Wow. Uh, what he talked about was things like he would retune his guitar to a different tuning so that when he played the old chord shapes for the original tuning that he wasn't using, the chord shapes would, would sound like something completely new. And sometimes when you do this, retune your guitar, you can get ugly results and sometimes you can get really interesting results. Um, 
But anyways, he was the king of doing this stuff, and he would play one of his own older songs with a new tuning using the same original shapes, but with the strings tuned differently. Yeah. And write a new song. He would change the tempo of it and fiddle around with it until he had a new creature. And he showed me how one song came out of another song. And you could actually hear the genesis of how they flowed together. It was totally fascinating. It's almost like a um, the classical music approach. Yes, except that Annie Partridge knows almost no theory as far as I can tell. Wow. And I do mm-hmm. I don't mean that disparagingly because the guy doesn't need to know any theory. Yeah. He just is intuitively brilliant. And I've always had a tremendous amount of respect for him. Um, his approach to songwriting really influenced me in, in, because he's always modulating into different key signatures, which is something that's not easy to do if you want to do it in an interesting way. And he does it all the time, like it's breathing, and achieves these effects that I've never heard anybody else come close to. That must have been incredible to go from. I'm, I'm assuming you were familiar. You were listening to XTC when you were growing up, right? Oh yeah. So going from listening to this uh, pretty iconic band that uh, some say birthed an entire music genre in Britpop, and living in Winnipeg, growing up in Winnipeg, to I'm assuming just having that as part of your set list. You like the song, you cover the song, the, getting asked to make it for a movie, and then having lunch with the man himself. That's like, you can make a movie out of that. I know. It was like c- coming full circle. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. That's crazy. And just hearing you talk about some of those tips and tricks as well, are you are you still writing? It's been a little while since there's been new music from the Crash Test Dummies. Yes, Is there... It has been a long time. To be quite honest with you, my accountant said to me one day after I made – my last record, which was 2010 or some damn thing. Uh, he was like, you gotta stop making records. You're going to go broke. <laughs> <laughs> and this was when Napster was coming out. Yeah. And CDs suddenly fell off in sales and streaming took over. Yeah. And before streaming paid anything, there was a period where all of a sudden I had been making regular money and suddenly I was not. Yeah. And uh, so I could no longer afford to make records and I stopped making them. But um, lately, and this is a long story that I'll make short, when COVID started, I took up classical piano of all freaking things. Good for you. Uh, and um, I'm also taking composition lessons. Actually, I have a lesson after our interview. Hmm. Um, and uh, the composition lessons I'm taking are learning how to do counterpoint, which is a method of writing that was invented to uh, accommodate co- big vocal groups. And it was invented in the roughly speaking, very roughly speaking, the 15th century, 16th century. And uh, invented is probably too strong a word. It emerged as a practice and became codified in books. Um, And Bach and all the greats studied counterpoint, even if they didn't use it. And I've been writing some new material in counterpoint which is a completely different thing for me and um, something that I'm really enjoying doing. And I, I think that I may try and make a recording of at least a few tracks. Right. Because a lot of people, and tell me if I'm wrong, but it seems like a lot of people re- don't necessarily release a whole record every time they put something There's out. real, honestly, there's, it no. seems, it seems like, the actual record release date is far less impactful than, uh, you know, the days that bands or artists release their first or second or third single, for sure. I absolutely get that. I mean, it is interesting that every Friday I go through the new music playlist, which is only singles. 
it's like Spotify or YouTube or whoever is hand selected based on whoever, who knows what uh, criteria, a list of 50 songs or whatever of the newest music out there. But it never, ever, ever um, really, unless you're looking for it, I feel like it doesn't encourage you to go and actually listen to the full product. 100% does not. It's something you have to know you're going to do. Yes, exactly. The art of the album has been lost. And it really was a it's kind of an art form unto itself, you know, two sides of a piece of vinyl and a sequence of six songs on each side. Not that that was a strict number, but a general number and uh, kind of a nice number. Do you do you uh, take the time to sit down and, and really hone in on, on a full record from beginning to end that, that you, you know, is that something you explore these days? I'm taking it a song at a time. Okay. I don't know if I'll write a whole record or if I'll put out a few songs and see how that goes. Right. I'm, I think I might do the latter. Um, I, to, I'll be totally honest with you. I'm having a hard time writing. It's not coming easily to me. Interesting. And when it comes, I've, I've been extremely happy with the results so i wrote a song that i think is really one of my best um and i've got another lyric that's waiting for music waiting for me to write music <laughs> <laughs> and um <clears throat> so i'm by no means idle i have certainly been working on new material so with some of the, the learning that you're doing, are you hoping that will maybe fuel some of the creativity and kind of kickstart things if you can kind of maybe pick sure. from some different areas? Yeah, it absolutely has. Like the the song that I wrote was, um, this will sound very pretentious, but it was an art song, for lack of a better term. That's a, that's a term that's used in academia. <laughs> and, and it's the to the extent that it's not a verse and a chorus. It does not have that formula. It does not have any of the formulas of either rap or pop music. Not to say that rap isn't pop, but you know what I mean. Um, so, yeah, writing in this new vein is, uh, is uh, really chiefly what I'm interested in doing. And um, what I'm working on right now is a vocal piece, which is modeled uh, after what's called the motet, or the, you might have heard of the term madrigal. Have you ever heard of the term madrigal? It's a term, an English term for uh, Renaissance songwriting. Okay, no, I'm not familiar. Yeah, and they they don't necessarily use verses and choruses. Right. In it way often they're just verses it's um, it's interesting though like hearing you say that uh you know songwriting isn't as easy or isn't easy right now for you but despite that you you have written something that you feel is is amongst your best work and in that conversation about um do people listen to full albums or not anymore you know the answer seems to be no for the majority which is is kind of a good thing in your position because now you can take that that one mm -hmm. piece that you think is is some of your best work and put it out as such, right? Yes. That, that yeah. you, you wouldn't have been able to do that in the nineties. No, not at all. So I, I, I'm optimistic. I want to hear it. You got to put it out. <laughs> well, thank you. <laughs> you can road <laughs> test it in red deer. Yes. September 15th. <laughs> <laughs> well, not with an orchestra though, unless we, we haven't uh, checked the, uh, the information correctly. I don't know if we're getting a full orchestra in bows. <laughs> No, that probably won't happen. <laughs> um, so w w tell us a little bit before we let you go. What What is this lesson tonight then? You're taking, you said, composition lessons in counterpoint specifically. Yes. So it um, the way to describe counterpoint in the most easy to understand terms that I can think of is this. Um, first, think of modern music. Disregard counterpoint for a minute. In modern music, you hear a melody, and it's supported by chords. It's supported by the rest of the music. Mm -hmm. But the melody is the main thing. 
And what happens underneath the melody simply reinforces it. In counterpoint, oh, and by the way, there's usually three notes going on at the same time, or three voices when in, during chord changes. Um, Are we talking triads? Is that what we're talking? Yes, exactly, yeah. triads. So uh, in counterpoint, we don't have triads. All we have instead are melodies and more melodies and more melodies. So when you listen to Bach, for example, he'll start off a melody in the right hand of his piano playing, da 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 and then he'll go in the left hand, same pattern, right? Yeah. But he'll add something new in the right hand. And whatever he adds new is another melody. It's like a da 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 against his so it all adds up to a big texture without ever employing triads without ever employing chord changes i mean the notes frequently add up to triads right but that's not how the music is conceived or written it's not the bass it's not it's not it's particularly in before they used key signatures and they were using what are called modes mm -hmm. it was a different scene altogether and um, that's the background that Counterpoint was born in. That's what I'm deeply into right now. I'm, I, I have to say, and you've been talking. We've been talking about Counterpoint on and off for a few minutes. I'm having um, a realization that in my pursuit of musical education, which ended around 18, uh, this is exactly where I stopped taking theory lessons. <laughs> 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 I think Counterpoint is the point I reached where it's just like. Uh, uh, did i yeah, cut out there brad you did anyways you're you're the good. point the point is counterpoint is you're where good. it lost yeah. me but now yeah. but you've again, explained it you've say, explained yeah. it in such a way that i might go sign up again need a teacher like brad <laughs> <laughs> well you know the, i my my counterpoint teacher said to me once brad counterpoint is like teaching nuclear physics uh, when you <laughs> Half the class just doesn't get it, like just for starters. And it's like, it took me several years to get to the point where I could actually compose in counterpoint. What you do when you learn counterpoint, and I, maybe I'm talking about it too much now, but you learn what are called the five species. And the different species of counterpoint are just different ways of approaching different notes. and note combinations and they're all based on formulas and you have to write according to formulas like there's you know if the note is if the note is this far away from the other note then the next note has to be that far away from the other note it, you know it, i mean it's not that narrowly prescribed you do yeah. have some freedom but there's a lot of limitations which means you get to be really creative working around the limitations and try and you know, uh, doing using the method gracefully and getting that's the goal is to get good fluid results where every voice is as important as the other voice in its own way. I mean, there's always going to be one voice that's more prominent than the other voice. Mm -hmm. That's just always going to be the case. And uh, interestingly enough, the when you write in counterpoint the you get to the point where you're writing in three voices and when you're uh when you're when you're doing that oh what was i going to say about counterpoint in three voices damn now i've forgotten it's terrible well you're uh, gonna you're probably gonna remember during your lesson you're gonna remember exactly that's what's gonna happen and then you can tell us all about it on september well, 15th you know i'm actually <laughs> is this uh, is this an in-person lesson that you're going to or is it an online it's online. Um, the guy's in Singapore right now. Oh, wow. Wow. Where are you from? I'm thinking, but like, he, I honestly don't understand a word. I get you're picking up some of it, yeah. but it's friggin' fascinating. So I almost kind of want to sit in on this lesson. <laughs> can we just, can we zoom in? <laughs> you probably could. Yeah, I'd be open to that. <laughs> uh -huh. Well, um, we're really excited to have you back in uh, Red Deer. Um, in just, I mean, it's it is like less than two months, right? Holy shit! Oh yeah, just over a month away. Like yeah, where I crazy. Think we're, by the time this uh, airs, I think we'll be about six weeks out. That is true. So, 
So another show for people that can talk about for another four years after. I'm, no pressure. I'm very much. <laughs> I'm very much looking forward to it. Well, thanks uh, so much for hanging out, Brad. We really appreciate you uh, spending the time. No, thanks for having me. I appreciate you spending the time as well. All cool. right, have fun with that lesson. Don't, don't, you know, <laughs> take it easy. I'll try not to fall apart. <laughs> <laughs> thanks, Brad. Okay. Peace. See ya. Have a good one. Yeah, you too. All right. Bye bye. Uh, that's the first time I think I've ever pulled the mic cable out of the mic on the road. The stage. That's the first time you've ever pulled out triads. Yeah, like well, where the hell? How? I had my days with uh, the you textbooks. Dr- were you a drummer? Yeah, but I had to do you. Do, you you got to know music theory. Mm. But that that is exactly the point in theory when I was like, I don't fucking understand this. Yeah. Counterpoint is where it was. All I can think about is is like levels of wizards. Right, like when Gandalf what the are you White talking turns about? into Grand- Gandalf because of the knowledge and everything. That's like oh, another... okay. I thought this was they, some, they, the they way someone up. taught you scales. No. <laughs> yeah, that's definitely the way. Like it was. different Lord of the Rings characters. <laughs> F for Frodo, if, G for Gandalf. If I'm gonna understand it, that's probably what we're gonna have to <laughs> come up with something. But it just yeah, it seems like that's next level shit. Uh, yeah, but also only... like how many musicians would 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 get into that? Would go that far into it? I don't think I got past grade three of theory, and there's I think ten or fifteen. So it's pretty. It's not it's not that deep in. I don't. Think. No, but you R- have to. Ryan, know... how much of that stuff did you followed along? Understood that all fairly well. Does he know mm-hmm. counterpoint? Do you know counterpoint? Anyways, that was uh, that was very interesting. I hope that he puts that music out. I you know what? Honestly, I hope so as well. I'm always down to hear orchestral or vocal and, and and this is the like this is the day and age to do that like i understand what he's saying about from the money standpoint so you got to have the means to be able to get it recorded yeah but as long as you can do that it doesn't the rest of it is just put it out yeah that was uh that was a good chat so september 15th september 15th we'll not miss it this time around because i did and we didn't really talk about it too too much um and it's and it's kind of a weird question to get into with them as well but i mean they were on such a trajectory and like you said superman song was huge in canada and then mm, and what followed after really didn't do as well in canada but did well in the states they got nominated for a grammy uh several mm-hmm. junos and then they released a worm's life in 96 things started 90? to slow down right and things started to slow yeah. down but i went back and listened to that album yesterday to think like why why did it slow down and i like as i listen to that album i can't think of like it's not that different yeah from what they had been doing so why it's so it, that part i'd like to get into theory of that of, of pe- how people consume that kind and of how theory. all of a sudden something just that was resonating with people like crazy yeah all of a sudden is now not how how why yeah yeah i mean and that's uh that's a question we will ask him after the theory lesson on okay. september 15th i look forward to that all right, Peter Michaels, you're going to go camping? I'm out of here. I'm just going to go, uh, yeah, just to stick a chair in the you river. You got any albums that you're planning on listening to in your camping days? You, you know, honestly, we, and we touched on a little, I haven't, I skimmed through the new Jack White album. Oh, you haven't actually But listened. I haven't actually had a chance to really sit down and okay, absorb cool. the new Jack album. How about so that Viagra Boys that record? for sure. Yeah, so of course, that's, we'll Did have you, that. Do you give it a spin at all? I haven't, no. Fuck, it's good. It's really, <laughs> really good, dude. It's been busy the last little while. Viagra Boys, Cave World, check it out. I'll get into it. All right. Shout out to Sawback Brewing Company, Bose Bar and Stage, Go Services, Inc. And our friends here and uh, amazing producers, Ryan and Riley, Communal Creative Studios, YouTube. Subscribe, like, comment. If you go to a video on the CCS YouTube page, chances are you're going to see my comment. You do comment an awful lot. I do. I do. You got a lot to say. You got a lot to say. Uh, You'll have more to say when? Wednesday? The Road to the Stage is produced by Ryan Cooley and Riley Sir Yin at the Communal Creative Studios in Red Deer, Alberta. In partnership with Go Services Inc., Sawback Brewing Co., Tourism Red Deer, and Bose Bar and Stage.